Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining the Behind Company Lines podcast. Today we have Alex Nickett, founder and CEO of Maru, payments platform for the wedding and events industry. Alex, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm really excited to dive deep into your background, your experience, and get to know what, you're, what you've got going on at Maru. But before we jump into that, what were you doing before you started the company? Hey, Julian. Pleasure to be here and thanks a lot for inviting me on your podcast. Um, before starting Maru, I worked for a year and a half at Revolut here in London, where I'm currently based. My responsibility just included building their corporate finance function, financial modeling, and I was also part of the core team raising Series D back in 2020. Before Revolut, I spent seven years working in General Electric Company, also in corporate finance. I initially started in Moscow, Russia, but then you know, it moved to pretty much globally. So all over the, you know, our family moved, you know, to China, to France, to UK, you know, a bunch of states in the U S back to Paris, then back to London. And my first work workplace was a Procter & Gamble. So I did a couple of years there after graduation from the university. That's incredible. How was the experience like moving to different countries and, and also were you doing the same job function at, at each kind of career stop or was it with the same company? Tell me a little bit more about um, that. It was more like, um, it was something like an internal audit function. Yeah. So my job at GE, it included various, uh, various projects. So it, 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 the range was between implementation of, you know, ERP systems on a massive, you know, scale businesses to just pure financial audits to supply chain, of, you know, improvement projects. And then, yeah, and it was a pretty interesting experience because we were moving all over the place, as I mentioned, together with my family. And yeah, I mean, we, we had a chance to see like how such a global business like General Electric is is built mm -hmm. uh, and how, how it works on the scale yeah. the whole planet pretty much. Yeah. I, I, when, when, when looking at business, obviously now you're, you're within the startup space and, but you know, we're working within the corporate level and how different is each environment. And, and I guess what are the components that a company that's global has to kind of get involved in or, or think about when building business and connecting with relationships and, and working internationally and globally that, you know, say a startup doesn't necessarily have to focus on. Well, so it's, it being a part of the bigger company gives a perspective how things should work on the scale. So it, it actually was very nice transition for me coming from like a massive organization first to Revolut because, you know, it was kind of taking more risk, but then like scaling a bit or going a bit lower into like more focused type yeah. of work. And then like when I started my own company, it was like highest risk, but like super narrow. So I think yeah. it just gives you an opportunity to understand kind of how the end state should look yeah. and then kind of connecting the thoughts when you start something yourself, like this is where I need to go. And like, you kind of already know the reverse engineered like path to get there. Yeah. How, how should it, you said, you know, it, it gave you an insight on how companies should scale or should work at that scale. How should, how should they work? How, sh how should they be organized and strategized at that level? Yeah. So I think it's mainly about like what departments sh should be there, how they should be, com you know, communicating between each other. It's also interesting to, to, to see the difference between, you know, in every company, there is its own culture and there is also like one or two departments that are the, the strength of the company. Just to give you a perspective, our example, actually Procter & Gamble, it's usually HR and marketing. Yeah. In GE, it's engineering and finance. In Revolut, it's actually product and, well, product and engineering. So, and those departments, they have power, they have negotiation power at the table and like they drive their initiatives and have the strength. So it's also good. Like when, when I started Maru, just looking like which departments should be, you know, stronger and you know, what should have, what, what part of the company should have a louder voice, I would say, you know, we're building, you know, payments or tech products. So engineering function and like perspective is, is really strong at the same time. Our market is very emotional. So wedding and events, like you can't remove emotion from there, which is why marketing and everything related to, you know, brand and design of the product is essential. Otherwise it will be just another like horizontal solution that, you know, that's already present on the market. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And going to your experience at Revolut and, and I was reading a little bit about your background and you were part of kind of the core team that raised the series D, which is, you know, a, a huge success. It's a massive round 500 million. What goes into the strategy and then the planning around that, that's different from previous rounds that you had raised amongst that company? Well, to, to be very transparent, this was the only fundraise I've had, so I can't, you know, judge at the same time I can compare, you know, what was serious D at Revolut versus 
you know, precede and sit around financing with my own company. So obviously, you know, when on the later stages, you have much more data to back, back up your story. You can actually paint it only through the data, through the charts. And especially like if it's, you know, going top right corner, it's so much easier to articulate, you know, your, your strength and, you know, your, your traction, which, and like my responsibilities included, like taking those historic, historical data and projecting it into the future, basically taking into account various like, initiatives that the company was taking at that time or planned. You know, for example, expansion, original expansion, product expansion. Yeah. So like, you know, inter introduction of different, uh, yeah, like new segments on the market and you factor it on in, into the model and, you know, produce the, the end result where we think we're going to be, you know, at the next fundraise. So like in the next milestone, and this is yeah. what it's going to be in terms of, you know, much more early stage fundraise, which, you know, the experience I had. So for example, our, our pre-seed fundraise, I, I spent like around 160 meetings with investors. And I think at the first hundred, I just got straight no, just like because. So it's, it was a very kind of humbling experience because you kind of like, I, I started and approached it in the beginning, like with this revolute bravado, just like, Hey, you know, I can do, I did this so I can do that too. And reality is like so much different. Like you have like in that case, in my case, I had the idea on a napkin and never, nobody kind of believed in it. So it, it took a while, but it was, uh, it was interesting kind of also experience and learning journey, just like to grow your skin, make it like much, much thicker, <laughs> being okay with like hearing no for a hundred times and just like keep pushing regardless of what's, what's happening around. So it's been two years, like pretty much exactly two years since, since, you know, we started the company and you know, we're in a much better place right now. Uh, you know, we, we didn't announce it publicly, so that's kind of exclusive for, for your podcast, but you know, we, yesterday, we, yesterday night, actually, we hit our one mail ARR, you know, Incredible. milestone, which we have spent 10 months, you know, going to it. So we're kind of very excited and, you know, internally and yeah, can't wait to, to share it with the broader, you know, public. That's awesome. I mean, congrats on the success. And, and it sounds like there's been so much work that's, that's done and I'm low and Definitely want to dive into kind of the work and, and, and what's involved in the success of, of Maru. But one last question in regards to your experience raising money that, that was different from obviously the, the Series D is what changed, did anything in, in your strategy change after hearing the hundred, you know, no's that, that you received from, you know, from the different investors? I think a lot of people think about, you know, one direction and just kind of using that strategy, that initial strategy that they, that they built and the initial pitch, you know, everything that, that is encompassing their their product pitch to get the investors and, and moving forward with that. But is there's anything that you would kind of recommend to founders as they move through this process on, you know, either changing or, or adjusting to, to see success? So in terms of changing, definitely improve your pitch. So yeah. like with every presentation, with every call with investors, I like, I always noticed what worked, what did, where people got hooked up on like. Something was not clear for them. So like I, I improved the way how I was saying this, or for example, when I made the statement and the person or like actually five people like asked me multiple times, like, what exactly do I mean? In the next calls, I just started saying it differently, like providing more information, like making very clear upfront. So it, you know, you just kind of do it again. Like in my case, it was 260 calls. And like in the end, it just like, you know, a song, very fluent, very like clear, you know, you just keep pitching and people just see this drive, you know, confidence and passion about what you're doing. And yeah, you know, it, 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 they just, they just feel it. Yeah. And well, they, they follow in terms of what not to do, I would say, don't change your pitch based on investors feedback. Basically don't change your idea of what you're doing. Like based on this, you're like, I had so many, like I had this collection of emails when I sent to people and when they were telling me like, you know, if I would be your friend, I would just like, I would recommend you to drop this idea and do something different. Like this is, this will lead you to nowhere. And, or just people like telling me like, this is small market or like, it's not going to go anywhere, this kind of stuff. So don't see on this, it's just like not your people and move on and keep pushing with the, with the vision and idea you've had, because otherwise, you know, your product will be just, uh, you know, patched blankets, you know, like stacks with of, of ideas of different people which in the end, like nobody will need it, or it will be needed by like this small group of people, that small group of people, but not a cohesive, scalable platform that you can, you know, grow over the next, I don't know, like five, 10 years. Incredible. Yeah. That, that's, that's great advice. Diving into Maru, what inspired the idea? 
Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's actually a funny story. So I left to at the time was I had first time in my life. I had one month gap between, you know, jobs. So literally nothing to do. So I was just chilling and the friend of ours, she got married in New York at the time. So almost 2020 and she called my wife, shared all the issues she'd been through, like during the wedding planning process, her wedding planning process, and also how, com- how difficult was it to pay for the wedding? And, and, and you can imagine it's like midst of COVID. It just started, so it's kind of like a mess. And I was like sitting and thinking, like, I've been following Clark and for, for quite a while, just so from the professional standpoint. And I was like, why can you buy a Peloton bike for like 3,500 bucks, finance it over like two years, but you come to the same for $3,500, you know, wedding photography invoice. So <laughs> what I did, I quickly built the landing page, you know, just, I think at that time I called the company Wet Plan or like Wet Feet. Wet pit. And I also, you know, did some market research, learned that 90% of ladies in the U S within one or two days after being engaged, they make an Instagram or Facebook post. And in 76% cases, they use three hashtags engaged proposal. I said, yes. And basically what I did, I went through Instagram and Facebook messaged everybody whom I found like those posts at that time saying, congrats guys, beautiful rain, you know, you're a beautiful couple. By the way, I started this company that offers 0% APR financing. If you want check it out here. And I, I think I sent around 300 messages until basically Instagram block. And then I got 92 responses within a couple of days. And that kind of made me think like, all right, there is a interest of people, you know, they, they really need something, but then she can be needed. And Jeff just started digging within the two or three months, I engaged a friend of mine from Revolut just to build a very like rough prototype. And we processed first few transactions, mainly from the money I, I borrowed from my dad. So it was kind of a fun journey in the beginning. But yeah, I mean, after that, you know, in Imperial, I was doing all those investor calls and within six months, like by the end of six months, we closed our first round of 800K. A lot of angel investors, you know, a few funds, couple of funds, and one including basically Y Combinator. So we were yeah. accepted to summer 21 bed, which was pretty exciting. And, you know, it's also very important to note in the, in the beginning of 2001, I met my co-founder. Her name is Anya Winika. So she spent 15 years in the weddings industry in the U.S., worked at the company called The Knots. It's basically a global leader in the wedding space. And she worked there since 2005, kind of building and growing the platform with the, with the original founders. So kind of let's hit everything in the market. Like I think she knows Anya and she knows a lot of people. So it was kind of blessing, you know, for us to, to meet. Because, you know, I break this finance uh, kind of expertise. She brings weddings expertise. And it really like ma- made a very good match and I'm going to just to push that particular product for yeah. And as I mentioned, like we started as a buy now, pay later, or like fly now or a firm full weddings idea. That's the idea we went through, which, you know, through IC, but we quickly realized that the NPL or buy now, pay later is just the one payment method. And we kind of shoot ourselves in the foot by offering only one, one option. And we decided let's do zoom out and start just offering digital checkout experience for the industry, because the typical, you know, transactional flow in the wedding space is checks and envelopes with cash, you know, some like maybe ACH transactions, like fragmented card and so on. So we took decision, let's make a BNPL as one of our payment methods. But in addition to that, let's add a bunch of new kind of contemporary payment methods that will help to improve, drastically improve payment experience, both for the couples, but most importantly for the businesses. Cause I want to make sure it's also like very clear, you know, with couples, you have pretty much hundred, well, we hope hundred percent sure, like they don't come back. Yeah. So the, and you have them over like 12 to 15 months at max maximum because they got married and they're out. So for us, the biggest, then the main focus is actually the business. So the wedding, uh, planners, venues, transportation, photographers, videographers, entertainment, like flowers, a- any other provider. In the market, it's a pretty large market. So 600,000 businesses only in the U.S. And the total U.S. weddings market is $100 billion industry. So there are 2.1 million weddings every year, regardless like prices, non prices, which makes free, you know, agnostic to external events. And with the average cost of wedding between like $40,000 to $50,000, that's, that's what makes this hundred bill, you know, number. Yeah. So basically right now, just kind of, you know, to, to conclude. We started with a BPL right now. We kind of transitioned to be more like a finance platform, like payments platform for wedding, you know, professionals, wedding and events professionals that at the moment, we're just working on improving the, the payments experience. And yeah. there is, there is a lot of items that 
you know, we, we, we do, so we do invoicing, we do payments, payroll, international payments, lending, so not lending, sorry, factoring. Uh, so what we call my book now pay later, and we have some other cool products in the pipeline that we're going to launch in 2023. That's incredible. And, and I love the, how you've transitioned the product through just the experience of the consumer and, and realizing that, and I love the idea of, of, of kind of taking a step back and seeing the broader view that not only is it, you know, paying now and, and, or booking now and paying later, but it's the idea of offering a seamless kind of payment process for an industry that has been probably the same for, uh, I don't know how many years, probably for a 10 plus, 20 plus, 70 years. Right. So, and, and it's kind of modernizing that process. I feel like some of the best and a, a lot of the most successful startups I've talked to kind of find themselves in that kind of service and technology piece where it's, it's not necessarily disrupting something, you know, you know, kind of an incumbent, but it is kind of offering a easy and more efficient way to complete processes in a certain kind of ecosystem or, or a service like weddings and wedding planning. So it's incredible to see the success and, and I'd love to hear more, like, tell me more about the traction, who are you working with? What kind of partners, obviously congrats on the, on the, you know, the recent one mil ARR. That's, uh, it's incredible. What's gotten you there and, and what are you kind of focused on in the near future? Yeah. I'm a lot of grind that I'm put to cut there. So we. We, as I mentioned, like we started with the BNPL and like we gradually introduced new products, which started, you know, monetizing over, over a period of time. Well, in terms of kind of the, the current, uh, whole offering, you know, we've been asked a lot. So like, you know, why it's a problem, like what problem you're solving because, you know, businesses accept payments right now without a problem, like Stripe, Square, Sum Up, whatever, like Venmo, PayPal, there are major players in, in this space. But the coolest part about us is like, we're solving problems such as there is a couple who is getting, they get an invoice from a photographer. At the same time, this couple has a wedding planner in between who actually manages those invoices, but the payment is done by the father of the bride. And like all this, like the route, the payment, like process, visibility on this invoice, control of the status, like mm -hmm. when it was seen, when it's past due reminders and so on. That's what we, you know, what we handle both. For, for the couple and for planners and for dads, wherever is needed and for the, for the end and, uh, service provider in terms of, you know, what's, what's coming next, uh, you know, we are currently just optimizing the, uh, the payment experience for, again, for, for both sides. Cause to be honest, like first year was just like, let's go quickly, fast, go to market. I, yeah, I would say like, we cared not much about, we, we didn't care a lot about the cost side of things. So now the priority is like, let's just optimize the margins. Because we can clearly see, you know, we increased our platform monthly TPV by 161x within 10 months. So, you know, there is a massive volume that's coming through the platform right now. So we, we have a lot of data to, you know, look at, um, improve, um, yeah, the key focus at the moment is just optimizing underlying costs. Yeah. 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 No, that's incredible. And. How do you, in terms of this experience, based on the past experiences, what's, what's exciting or I guess different about, you know, you, you were working in a corporate environment, you were handling a lot of different, not only financial, but logistics and auditing and, and kind of, and, in, in, in learning a lot about uh, kind of on a, on a grander scale, how companies work, but what's, what's, what's got you really excited about this opportunity and, and building your own company that, you know, that, that, that is different from your past experience. Yeah. Uh, you can ask my friends, they will tell you, like, I, I always, you know, regardless where I worked, whether it was G or Revolut, I, I had the list of ideas. I always yeah. was, like writing them down, thinking like one day I'm going to get to them, but obviously like, due to a lot of, you know, work that I've had at, at each and every like project that I worked on, never had time. And it, it just happened to be like one that kind of like really made sense, you know, because I, I, I'm, I feel that I'm a well, relatively creative person, just like. You know, I, I like art. I like, you know, sometimes to draw. I'm very into like product design just because, you know, I, I like this stuff. At the same time, you know, you, you can ask folks like, I, I love financial models, like building connectivity because it's also kind of, you know, creative pro pro project, but it, it makes sense like financially. So you understand like the dependencies, like solvency checks and mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So I, I really like in this role and this business that I kind of combine both. Like, you know, yeah. one of the coolest uh, or interesting aspects of Maru, especially from like design perspective, it should bring two, two things. One, it should give you trust as a user that, hey, you are actually like making payment for $50,000 for some, you know, some, you know, for a financial transaction, like you're giving that 50K. Yeah. 
And it, it, the platform on which you're doing this should translate this trust and like confidence, like everything is going to work properly and so on. At the same time, people need to remember and like be reminded they actually think for their wedding. So there should be something emotional that, that should kind of create a, the response in them. And like yeah. connecting those two, it's one hell of a task yeah. for, for us in the beginning and like for our designers right now. So I'm, I'm really, you know, excited about this challenge because for me, it kind of breached two parts of my personality, like emotional, creative, and like analytical yeah. and financial. How do you, how do you create that, that experience, but also, you know, do kind of, I, I don't know if it's the dirty work, but uh, of the, you know, the, the transactions that are just necessary, the necessary, just like transactions. How do you, how do you connect those two? Cause that's difficult. It's, it's on something that they don't, I guess, naturally go and coincide together and that they would need some kind of effort behind that. But how do you do that? Yeah. Luckily again, I have a great co-founder. So Anya, again, she has this field of the industry of people who are going through the wedding planning process. She knows like, you know, everything about the typical couple that that's going through level bright, that's going through the payment experience, you know, how stressful it is, how, you know, what's we, we, at some point when we just started, we actually draw the emotional kind of Corolla poster, like how people feel depending on like the engagement period until the wedding date and like what emotional stress they experience over this period of time. And like when we can approach those people, you know, those, those couples and like when it's best to give certain communication, so on. So to answer your question, my co-founder, she brings really, you know, that's, you know, industry specific knowledge on the visuals on the brand on the yeah. design. And I, I guess I'm more like a clearly like finance guy in this case, <laughs> who, are, who ensures that, you know, transactions actually goes from like point A, point B with all the participants being involved in the right way. Yeah. Yeah. I love that cohesive relationship. I, I have that with, with my co-founder as well. And, and just talking to other founders, it's, it's so valuable to have that, that relationship and, and kind of complement each other in the, in the skills that you have. Tell me about what are, what are some of the biggest risks that Maru faces today? Biggest risks. I feel we started growing faster than we anticipated. We're basically like, uh, you know, hitting the ceiling of like our internal capacity, both from the you know, engineering perspective. So that's why we, for instance, rebuild the whole, uh, backend and front end of, of the mm. platform, because like all the monolith type of code that we we'll build in the beginning, very quickly, you know, it wasn't sustainable anymore. So just like making sure that we would continue to make the transition, that that's the biggest risk I see. I would say just in general, kind of the, the, the trust factor, cause like we're a new, new mm -hmm. company coming into like a market that's pretty well established. Again, the, the benefit for us, there's not many players in our field, like vertically specific. Yeah. You know, we have a couple of competitors, but other than that, uh, there's just horizontal players such, you know, take like Clark and firm, Stripe and Square or PayPal. But yeah, so I, I guess the, the biggest risk for any startup is execution. Yeah. So how well you can prioritize, how well you can execute, which is again, I like this. Well, I, I feel good about this risk because it's internal. And uh, it's pretty much like all in our control. So as long as we get the team on board with the vision that we have and the goals we set for, for the company for this and next year, I don't think like there should be anything stopping us. Obviously market environment is, is difficult, but I'm glad that we pivoted away from being solely focused on the pineapple later to a more like a broader and cohesive, you know, platform that solves a much bigger problem than just like you know, financing, there, there is just so much more value that we bring into the process that gives us this, you know, significant lever not to be dependent on like, or being worried too much about rising, you know, interest rates, general kind of collapse looks like of the global economy or like, the, you know, yeah. every region, something's happening here and there. Yeah. So I would say yeah. that, that, that those are kind of the few. Yeah. Well, if everything goes well, what's the long-term vision for Maru? I would say my ideal state of things will be like, you know, like when we think about travel, the first thing we go is Airbnb. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So like, oh, I'm, I'm going like to, to travel, I'm going to check Airbnb. Right? So I wanted that in the future for people, when they get engaged, the first thing they do is they create Maru account and they start organizing their financials, you know, in place on the platform. They start planning their payments to their vendors, like adding them into their their favorites and stuff like that. And like planning their budget because, you know, our key focus is, and will always be a finance yeah. financial part of the wedding planning process. We, we're not interested to go into the, 
emotional component of like choosing the colors and the theme and like this type of stuff. Because first of all, there are just so many other platforms. Secondly, I don't think like we can bring much value. I feel like our core expertise, like FinTech payments, just like making the, one of the biggest problems in the wedding space, like payments, you know, making it smoother. Um, yeah. and yeah, I just like, I guess I, I want to make sure that in the future, you know, when, well, actually not even when they engage, but like when the guy is thinking about like, or whatever, uh, if one partner is thinking about, uh, proposing to the, their partner, they create an account with us. Yeah. If they need extra like money for the ring, they can approach us up front or then like once they, you know, got engaged, they start creating and building their profile, adding their parents in the. I don't know, like com contributors yeah. to the wedding budget, you know, adding guests if they want for cash registry and stuff like that. Incredible. No, I love that. I always like to ask this question, not only for, for selfless research purposes, but also for my audience. What books or people have influenced you the most? A lot, but the most recent, I, I really like this build by Tony Fadell. You know, there, there's a lot of like, you know, American literature, business literature that's like have one or two ideas in the book, they just keep posting it like over 400 pages and you're like, guys, I already got it. Like, you know, I don't need another anecdote to support this idea. So in, in, in his book, in, in builds, I really like that there's just like every, every article or every chapter, it has its, its own standalone idea. And it, it, it's really relevant for different like moments in your life or, you know, entrepreneurial journey or interaction with the team and so on. So like. You don't need to read it like from the beginning to an end. You could just jump in the middle and you're going to get the value and you can go back. So I keep coming back and forth, like with the book, I read it once, but I'm reading some articles again and again, because it's just so helpful. Just kind of reminding yourself, yeah. you know, one of the recent aspects, you know, we yeah, brought up with my team was like, you know, he, he's talking about the fact that the company should be focusing on one customer. Like in our case, as you can imagine, we have couples, we have deafness and you know, you always kind of, you need to take the side, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And like, it's a very important because, you know, he's saying like the moment the couple, the, the company's trying to like take, sit on both chairs, that's when it starts going to an end. And yeah, those kind of reminders is really helpful. Incredible. Incredible. Well, thank you so much, Alex, for being on the show. I know we're at time here and, and I, I super appreciate not only just your experience and the knowledge you brought to the table and in, in regards to scaling and, and seeing how the larger organization and structure of a company kind of boils down to what you're doing now at Maru. And, and you know, it, it doesn't surprise me that you're having so much success. And, and I hope to hear that Maru is the Airbnb of, of wedding and wedding planning. Last little bit, I always like to ask my guests, where can we support? Give us your LinkedIn's, your Twitter's. How can we get involved? How can we support Maru and, and, and your... I don't know, just, yes. If you can like our posts on LinkedIn, our news, that will be incredible. If you have any friends in the U.S. who's getting married, you know, let them know about Maru because we can help big time. Amazing. Amazing. Well, Alex, thank you so much for joining the show. I, I appreciate it and I can't wait to share this with my audience and I hope you enjoyed yourself, but thank you again. Thanks, Jordan. Really good. Glad to be here. Thanks.